Well, um, I want to start by saying how honoured I am to be the final speaker for today and to finish um, such a fantastic conference. I hope that you've got a lot of value out of today. Um, and I'm also really excited because I get to talk to you about one of my favourite topics, which is strength-based parenting. And so what I'm going to do in this presentation is share with you a little bit of the science behind strength-based parenting, um, a couple of stories around strength-based parenting, and then some tips for you and how you can become a strength-based parent. Um, before I do that, what I would like to do is invite you all to join me in an exercise. And so um, if you feel comfortable, what I'm going to do is take you through a an exercise that's a guided visualization. So the best way for you to do this is to get comfortable in your seats. And if you feel comfortable, just close your eyes. And I want you to think about the piece of clay that you have just seen on the screen. And uh, I invite you to choose one of your children and take that piece of clay and start to mould that piece of clay into the shape of the child you have chosen. So turn that piece of clay into uh, a, a size of about the same size as your child, same head shape, same length and width of arms, torso, legs, feet. And when you feel that you have molded that piece of clay into the shape of the child that you have chosen. I'm going to ask you just to imagine yourself standing back and looking at your child as clay. And what you are likely to notice is that there are some bits of the clay that are already fully formed. Some bits that are just beautifully sculpted without you really having to do much as a parent. These, these pieces of the clay are already there in your child. And there are some bits of the clay that are a little bit misshapen, not quite fully formed. There are some bits of the clay that have cracks. There are some bits of the clay that have holes, maybe small holes, maybe even big holes. The bits of the clay that are already formed and the bits of the clay that are beautifully sculpted are the strengths in your children. They are the positive qualities and talents that your child was born with. And the bits of the clay that are not quite the right shape, that have cracks, that have holes, these are the underdeveloped bits of your child. These are their weaknesses, their faults, their flaws, their problem behavior. And what I'm going to ask you to do is to turn to the people next to you and just in a brief discussion, share with them what are the strengths, what are the fully formed bits of clay that you see in your child and what are some of the weaknesses, problem behaviors, limitations, flaws, foibles. So if you can just turn to the people next to you and have a brief discussion about that. Okay, thank you everyone. So when you are looking at your child as this piece of clay and you are seeing that some bits are already formed, some bits are quite beautiful and some bits still have room for improvement. Put up your hand, now being honest here, put up your hand if in the day-to-day -day course of your parenting, which of the two bits of clay get more of your attention and focus and energy? Is it the bits of clay that are form, fully formed and beautifully sculpted? Or is it the bits of clay that still need work? The holes, the cracks, the little bits that you just think, if I could just shape that just a little bit more, Please put up your hand if it's the leader. Yeah. And this is, in the day-to-day -day course of parenting, we do tend to, our attention tends to gravitate more towards the weaknesses and the problems in our children, 
rather than their strengths and their positive qualities. And there's a, an evolutionary reason for this and it's called our negativity bias and neuroscientists have now shown that our brain is hardwired to pay more attention to what can go wrong in our environment, more attention to the negative things than the positive things. So um, forget about parenting for a minute, just in general course of life, that's what we do. And then you throw parenting into the mix and we're busy and most of us share the same goal as parents. And that is that we want to help to develop um, these beautiful people that we've brought into the world. And we want to do our best to help them grow into sort of fully formed, resilient, robust, good-hearted people, good-hearted adults who are going to make a difference in the world. Most of us have that goal as parents. And, and that's the goal that I have for my two children. So I have, um, I have no problem with that goal, but I think that many of us can be misdirected in the pathway that we seek to achieve that goal. Many of us as parents, whether we're conscious of it or not, think that in order to create a fully formed piece of clay, that our role is to mend all the bits of clay that aren't right. That, that our role is to get extra putty and sort of press it into the holes, smooth out the cracks, get those little bits that are just not quite shaped the way you want them to and just sort of smooth them over and mold them. And because of that, we do tend to fall into the trap of paying a lot more of our attention and focus on sort of building up the weaknesses. And we tend to take the strengths for granted. We tend to think, oh, well, my son's just naturally a good communicator, so I don't have to do anything about that. That's already there. But actually what the science of positive psychology shows us is that when you spend your energy correcting a weakness, it doesn't mean that the strength is going to naturally build. So let's go back to the metaphor of the clay. Most of us attempted to fill in the holes. But what if we decided to take a strength-based approach to our parenting? And what if instead of filling in the holes, we decided to expand the bits of clay that are already there? We decided to put more emphasis on identifying and building the strengths in our children. So if you visualize this, the more that you expand the bits of clay that are already there in your child, the more that you build up their strengths, what happens to the holes? Just by default, the hole gets smaller and smaller and smaller because the, bit, the clay is expanding and expanding and expanding. So when you take a strength-based approach, you are both amplifying the strengths and minimizing the weaknesses. When we take a weakness-based approach, at best, we're fixing the weakness, but we're not doing anything to build the natural strengths that our children have. And you can imagine that it's a very different experience for a child who is growing up with parents, even if they're very loving parents, who are, whether they know it or not, are constantly saying, this is a problem we need to fix. This is a weakness that we need to fix. We really need to work on your impatience. We really need to work on your math, whatever it happens to be. That's a very, even, even a loving parent, it's a, it's a, the child grows up constantly hearing what they're lacking in, what they don't have. In strength-based parenting, it's a very different message because the child grows up hearing what you do have and how we can build and amplify that. So that's in essence what strength-based parenting is about. It, um, it's, a, it's a passion of mine, both as a researcher and as a mother, and it's also a passion of the field of positive psychology. And when Professor Martin Seligman and uh, Professor Cheek sent me hi, published the very foundational article, the first peer-reviewed article that launched the field of positive psychology, right back in 2000. They talked about the importance of bringing positive psychology into families. And they quoted that raising children is vastly more than fixing what is wrong with them. That in addition to doing that, if we take a positive psychology approach, they added to this quote. They said that 
It's also about identifying and nurturing their strongest qualities, what they own at their best, and helping them find niches in which they can best live out these strengths. So strength-based parenting is an approach where, as parents, we choose to place more of our time and energy on identifying and cultivating the positive qualities in our children, their strengths and their talents, and then finding their niche, finding the people, finding the projects, finding the activities, the interests, the environments that help those strengths come forward. I want to introduce you to my two children, Nicholas and Emily. Um, they are, yeah, oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm missing them right now because I've, I'm loving being in Mexico. I love it, but um, it's a long way away from Australia and, um, and I've been away from them for a couple of days now, so I'm, I'm ready to see them again. But Nicholas is uh, 13, Emily is nine, and um, I refer to them as my strength-based laboratory uh, because I have been experimenting on them with positive psychology since pretty much the day that they were born. Um, people often ask me, if I become a strength-based parent, does that mean that I just forget about, ignore problem behavior, weaknesses, limitations? And the answer to that is no. It's not, it's not an either or. I'm not being a strength-based parent and ignoring the other stuff. It's where you choose to place your focus first. So strength-based parenting is about first looking for what's right before you seek to fix what's wrong. It's about looking at good behaviours before you work on bad behaviours. And I'll give you an example of that with Emily. Um, she is in third grade now. When she started primary school and she was in first grade, she had a habit of finishing her work more quickly than the people around her, the students around her, and then talking to her friends. Um, and uh, I have to say that the apple does not fall far from the tree in that regard. Do you have that expression here? Because her mother is a bit of a talker. And when I was at school, I can tell you all the way through primary school, high school, every single report said, Lee is a good student, but she talks too much. Lee is a good student, but she talks too much. And now I think that it's pretty funny that I get flown across the world and my job is to talk to people. <laughs> so it was a strength that, that maybe wasn't recognised at school. Anyway, this is, <laughs> this, is, um, this is Emily and she's finishing her work early and she's talking to her friends and that's not the right thing to do because she's disrupting the class and she's preventing her friends from finishing her work. So, the beautiful teacher had a couple of conversations with me and so I spoke to Emily about it at home and I, now, one of the um, weaknesses that Emily has, and she will be the first to tell you this, is that she's not a particularly patient person. And again, the apple does not fall far from the tree. So I was talking to Emily, I was saying, you know, you need to finish your work and you need to be patient and you just need to sit quietly until everyone else finishes and then you can join back in the activity. Just sit quietly, just be patient, um, don't talk. And my approach did not work. So the teacher spoke to me again and then the teacher spoke to me again and I kept having this conversation with Emily, you know, just be patient, just sit quietly, just don't talk. And then she got sent to the principal's office. And then I realized, okay, what I'm doing is not working. And I also realized that I temporarily forgot that I'm a qualified psychologist. I temporarily forgot that I'm an expert in positive psychology. I temporarily forgot that my research specialty is strength-based parenting because I, I was just being a mum. And actually, I, I was not doing a very successful thing because what I was telling Emily to do was change her behaviour using her weaknesses, using the things that I know she's not good at. I'm saying, just be, be more patient, just be quiet, just sit still. These are three things that are not strengths in my daughter. And I was saying, hey, the solution that you need is just to draw on something that I know you're not good at. So 
I put back on my hat as a psychologist and positive psychology and an expert in strength-based parenting and I thought, what is a strength that I can use to help overcome this problem? Now, um, as much as Emily is not a patient person, she is an extremely kind person and she's just been that way ever since she was born. She, she, people want to be around her because they just naturally sense her kindness. She's always the little girl who notices if someone's not qu quite included in the conversation and she just very, in a very skillful way will bring them into the group. She's always the little girl who has been happy to share her food, share her toys. She's always been the girl who, if someone falls over in the schoolyard, it'll be Emily who takes them to the school nurse. So this is a strength that she just came with. I didn't, I didn't have to do anything to the clay. It was already there. And so I talked to her about this problem through the lens of a strength. I talked to her about this problem through kindness. And I talked to her about when you finish your work, the kind thing to do is to let your friends also finish their work. Because, you know, you get a good sense of achievement when you finish your work. So the kind thing to do is to be quiet. The kind thing to do towards your teacher is to not talk and not interrupt. And she got it immediately. I didn't hear a single word after that from the teacher about Emily's talking problem. So strength-based parenting isn't about ignoring the problem behaviours. It's about finding a strength-based solution to them. The idea that if the more you expand the clay that's already there, the smaller the holes become. So I was able to compensate for Emily's lack of patience by drawing on her abundant kindness. So that's an example. Um, Nicholas, as I said, he's 13. He, he is really the reason why I am standing up here today. Uh, because when I was pregnant with Nicholas 14 years ago, this was when the field of positive psychology had just been launched. Um, I think it's similar in Mexico. In Australia, we have, uh, the, it's the law that you have to finish, you start your maternity leave six weeks before your baby is due. Um, and I spoke with some colleagues at Tech Millennio the other day and they said it's similar in Mexico. So I had six weeks to go before Nicholas was born. I had stopped work. I was quite bored because, as I said, I'm a bit of an impatient person. And I couldn't do anything physical. So I thought, okay, I'm gonna read as many parenting books as I can in the next six weeks. Um, and I discovered Martin Seligman's book, The Optimistic Child. At this point, the field of positive psychology had not yet been launched, but I devoured the book the optimistic child. Um, a little bit about my backstory, I um, have suffered a mental ill health journey, I had an eating disorder in my teenage years and I suffered from a lot of anxiety and depression for well over a decade in my 20s. And so when I saw this book title, The Optimistic Child, I thought that's, that's what I want to do, I want to break the cycle. I don't want my son, I knew I was having a boy, I don't want my son to suffer in the way that I have suffered. And I'm not naturally an optimistic person. Um, after 15 years of throwing myself into the field of positive psychology, I'm a lot more optimistic, but it's not my natural tendency. And so I read this book and I learned that we can actually create an optimistic mindset in our children. And so I was hooked. And it just, it turned out that at that time, Martin Seligman published the very first book in positive psychology called Authentic Happiness. And so I read that book and I read about taking a strength-based approach and I decided that was it. This was how I was going to live my life. This is how I'm going to raise my children. This is the type of work colleague I'm going to be. This is the type of wife I'm going to be, friend I'm going to be, person that I'm going to be. So Nicholas really, he changed my life in so many ways and he's the reason why I'm standing up here. Um, he also changed my career direction, not just from positive psychology, but to start working with younger people and, and to be working with families and schools. Prior to um, 
the first part of my career, my PhD is in organizational psychology. And so actually I was doing a lot of work in the corporate world and a lot of research in the business school at the University of Melbourne. And then Nick came along and I was still working in the business school, but I was implementing positive psychology into the corporate sector. I was doing a lot of executive coaching with very senior executives in large multinational firms, mainly in investment banking. And I was introducing um, these senior executives to a strength-based approach. And every time I would finish my coaching relationship with a senior executive, and there was 12 sessions of coaching, without fail, they would say to me, why, why, didn't, why am I only learning about this now? I'm, being, I'm, I'm getting on in years, I'm a senior executive. It would have been so helpful for me to learn this stuff earlier in my career. And so I had this question running through my head. Yeah, that's a good point. Like, why am I working with senior executives? At that point, because I was an organizational psychologist, I was starting to think about how do we bring a strength-based approach into new recruits and people who are just starting their career. And so I had that idea sort of running around my head. At the same time, Nicola started kindergarten. And somehow the, these two ideas sort of merged. And I thought, why well, start at 24 when I can start at four? And I thought, OK, I need to start working with schools. I need to start bringing this strength-based approach into schools so that we're teaching young children about their strengths. Um, so that in 40 years time, when they have coaching, they're not asking, why didn't I learn about this earlier? So Nicholas got me into positive psychology in the first place, and then he changed my trajectory from uh, the corporate world to working with young children through uh, schools and families. So I want to tell you a little bit about strength-based parenting. And my definition of strength-based parenting is that it's a style of parenting that where parents seek to deliberately identify and cultivate positive qualities, positive states, and positive processes in their children. Um, I'm going to leave you to think on this one. But this is a key message that I want to get across. Your child is stronger than you think. Every one of us has strengths. And if they are lucky enough to have parents and adults in their life who from a young age are able to identify and cultivate those strengths, it makes an enormous difference to their well-being. I can say in my personal journey that I really only knew that I had strengths in my early 30s. And that knowledge that I had some strengths to draw on, that changed so much for me. It gave me a sense of peace of mind that whatever I faced, I knew I had this sort of internal resource. I had this like psychological toolkit that I know I have these strengths. I know that I'm intelligent so I can figure things out. I know that I'm a good hearted person so I can form relationships with people. I know that I want to do the best by people. So these were some things that, I, that other people saw in me maybe earlier than I saw in myself. But until I connected with those strengths, I wasn't able to utilize them effectively. So this is the thing about your children have strengths. And the, and the best part about strength-based parenting is it's actually a very enjoyable approach to parenting because your role is really simply to look at your children, find out what their strengths are, and help them play to their strengths. It's a very enjoyable way to parent. So I want to share with you some of the science that I've been doing around strength-based parenting, and then we'll finish off with some tips. Um, in terms of the science, I have adopted a well-known strength model. It's a strength model that comes out of the United Kingdom where um, these researchers, Govinji and Lindley, talk about two factors of strengths. The first factor is what they call strengths knowledge or strengths awareness. And as the name suggests, that's your own knowledge and awareness of what your strengths are. We all have different constellation of strengths. Some people are great at music, some people are great at sports, some people are, um, have amazing emotional intelligence and are able to read the emotions of others when they come in the room. We all have a different constellation of strengths. So the first part of taking a strength-based approach, according to this theory, is to simply have knowledge of what your strengths are. 
But what they also put forward in their theory is this second component, and that is strengths use. So it's one thing to know what your strengths are, but if you're not putting them into action on a regular basis, you're not getting the full benefit of taking a strength-based approach. So how much do you use your strengths in a variety of different settings? So I took this theoretic, theoretical uh, framework and I applied it into the strength-based parenting approach. So remember my definition that strength-based parenting is a style of parenting that seeks to identify and also to cultivate strengths. So these are the two key aspects of strength-based parenting and they map on to Govindji and Lindley's framework, onto their theory. When you identify your children's strengths, that's about strengths knowledge. And when you cultivate your children's strengths, that's about strength use. So taking this theory, I put it into action and I wanna share with you some of the research results that I've been finding over, over the last five years. I'm going to start with uh, one study that was published last year. This was a study done with just under 800 teenagers. And what I did in this study was I asked the teenagers to score their parents. So the teenagers told me to what degree they think their parents are strength-based. I know parents are in the audience going, ooh, a little bit nervous, wouldn't want my child to score me. Um, so to what degree is your parent, to, to what degree does your parent know what your strengths are and to what degree is your parent encouraging you to use your strengths? These are the types of survey questions that the teenagers completed on behalf of their parents. And what I was able to do with these responses is give the parents a score on the degree to which they are strength-based. In the survey, I also asked teenagers about another factor of parenting. It's known as authoritative parenting. It's a very well-known um, approach to parenting. It's been around since the 1950s. It was launched by a psychologist from UCLA. And authoritative parenting is a style of parenting where you are um, warm and loving, but firm and fair. And pretty much any parenting book that you read will have been influenced by this approach, being warm and loving and firm but fair. That's authoritative parenting. This a psychologist who put that forward also said that there's a, an alternative type of parenting, which she called authorita authoritarian parenting. So it's a bit confusing because the terms are very similar, but it's kind of the opposite parent, the cold, distant parent who is sort of overly strict. It's all about power and control. So these have been the two styles of parenting that psychologists have worked with for, for over 50 years. And not surprisingly, the research shows that the parents who are warm and loving and firm but fair have a better relationship with their children and their children do better. They have higher levels of well-being. they adjust better, they do better socially, they do better academically. So I took that style of parenting and the teenagers rated the degree to which their parents were authoritative, and they also filled in a survey that rated their levels of life satisfaction. And so what you can see here is that 16% of a teenager's life satisfaction was predicted by the degree to which they rated their parents as authoritative. So when teenagers feel that you are being warm and loving and firm but fair, this has a significant impact on how satisfied they are in their life. This is not a new finding. This finding has been around for about 50 years and it's always around the sort of 16 to 20% mark. The first thing that I take from this finding is that if you are the parent of a teenager, and I, I'm just starting that journey, Nick's just turned 13, um, you, you actually have more impact than you think. A lot of parents think, I'm not, you know, my, my teenager is becoming an individual, they're not at home, I'm not having any impact on them. But the teenagers themselves are telling me that 16% of their life satisfaction is predicted by the degree to which you are warm and loving and firm but fair. Now what I also did in this study was then added in the teenagers' ratings of strength-based parenting. And this is what I found, is that on top of authoritative parenting, when teenagers said, I have a parent who knows what my strengths are and encourages me to use my strengths, that contributed 19% more to the life satisfaction of the teenager. So 
combined, we get 35% of a teenager's life satisfaction based on the style of parenting that you are demonstrating towards them. In fact, strength-based parenting had more of an impact than authoritative parenting. But um, I, don't, I don't want you to walk away and think, well, I only need to be strength-based and I don't need to be authoritative. You need to be both. You have to have the, the warm, loving relationship first, and then you build on it with strengths. But what this study is saying is that love in and of itself is, is it's so important, it's so beautiful, but it doesn't give the same advantages as being loving and strength-based. Because I don't know about you, but a lot of people tell me when they reflect on their parents that they say, my, my parents were actually very loving, but they were not strength-based. So you can have loving parents who are still sort of constantly pointing out what's wrong and what needs to be fixed. And what my research is showing is that when you have the love and the strength-based approach, deliberately identifying and cultivating strengths, this has a significant impact on the life satisfaction of teenagers. Now, in this study, I was able to come back a year later and retest the levels of life satisfaction of these teenagers. And in that study, what I was able to do was have a look at, okay, well, I want to see if strength-based parenting a year ago predicts life satisfaction now. So the first thing I had to do in that equation was take into account strength, life satisfaction from year one to year two because that they often track together. So how satisfied you were in your life last year is a big predictor of how satisfied you'll be in your life this year, unless something major or dramatic happens. But then what I did in the equation was I added in strength-based parenting from time one. And it turns out in the analysis that strength-based parenting from a year earlier was still a significant factor in life satisfaction of teenagers a year later. So what that says to me is that if you start engaging in strength-based parenting now, you are investing in the future satisfaction of your child. Now, what you might have noticed in um, that study is this was to do with teenagers, and I was um, curious about the results. I wasn't surprised about the results, but I was curious about, well, how do we explain these results? And I think the way that we explain them is that when you become a strength-based parent, you change the lens of your children. They look at the world differently. Now, I've got the metaphor of the rose-colored glasses because they're going to look at the world more optimistically. They're going to look at the world through the lens of their own strengths. When you have rose-colored glasses, you can see, it doesn't mean that you don't see the clouds. It doesn't mean that you don't see the rainstorm. It doesn't mean that you don't see the darkness, but you see it in a different way. And so I think what's happening and why the teenagers are telling me when I have a strength-based parent, I have higher levels of life satisfaction is because they are starting to look at the world through the lens of their own strengths. And I'll give you another example from my own family. Recently, I was going to a reunion and Emily came with me and we were talking in the car and she was saying to me, mum, I feel a little bit nervous because I won't know any of the other kids and you know, I'm nervous about meeting them and how do I go and play with them? And I was saying, sweetie, I feel nervous too because I haven't seen these people for 20 years. And now, if I was just a loving parent, that would help Emily feel confident. She would know that she could go off and talk to the new kids and because she's got a loving mum, if she felt a bit nervous, she could come back. She knows she's got a safe place to come back to. But what I did in the car was I had a strength-based conversation with her. And I talked to her about, what do you think are your strengths that will help you in this situation? And so we talked about her kindness and that is strength of hers. And I talked to her about, you know, people, there's something about you, Emily. People just, they can see that you're kind. They, they know that if they come up to you, they'll be welcomed. Um, we talked about her strength of curiosity. Emily's very, very curious. So how could you use your strength of curiosity to go up and ask people questions about themselves or to figure out what are the rules of the game that are already being played so that you can step into the game? So this was a very different, it was an additional conversation. So what it meant for Emily was, yes, she knew that if she felt a bit nervous, she could come back to a loving mother, but she didn't need to 
because the way she was viewing that situation was through her strengths. She knew that she had some strengths that could help her to go and make friends. So this was uh, my sort of speculation that the reason why strength-based parenting contributes to life satisfaction is because it helps your children know and use their strengths. So the second phase of the study then was to go and test that. So I looked at the knowledge, strengths, strengths knowledge and strength use in parents. And this is um, a separate study where, again, about 400 teenagers rated their parents on strength use and strength knowledge. And then I asked the teenagers themselves in the survey, how, to what degree do you know what your own strengths are? And to what degree do you use your strengths? So this is the rose-coloured glasses piece. I mapped it onto life satisfaction, which was similar to the previous study, and then I added two more well-being indicators. And what I found is that this model was significant in its statistical testing. So the mechanism, the reason why strength-based parenting is contributing to well-being indicators in teenagers is because what it's doing is it's connecting the teenagers to their own strength knowledge and their own strength use. Okay, so we're starting to see a little bit of a pattern here, but what you would have also noticed in those two studies is that I was asking the teenagers, tell me about your parents. So then I did another study and I asked the parents, tell me about yourself. So this was a, a study that I published last year First thing I did was I asked the teenagers, tell me about your strength use, tell me about your strength knowledge, and is it predicting life satisfaction? And I found again in a third sample, yes, this consistent pattern is happening. But then I also asked the parents to rate themselves. To what degree do you think you know your children's strengths? And to what degree do you think you encourage them to use their strengths and you put them into situations where they get to grow and cultivate their strengths? And I added that into the model. And when I added that into the model, it makes, it adds significant variance. So the teenager's use and knowledge creates life satisfaction, but even the parents themselves, when we add that a part of the equation in, not the teenager's rating of the parents, but the parents' own rating, it made a significant difference to life satisfaction. So I want to share with you two more studies and then I'll move on to some tips. So far I've talked to you about some of the studies that I've done with teenagers, but um, I imagine that there are parents in the audience who have younger children, and I have younger children myself. So I wanted to find out, is this same pattern occurring for younger children? And this was a study I did, did uh, with fifth and sixth graders, so 11, 12-year-old, 10, 10 to 12 was the age range. Again, looking at that sort of same pattern, if the children rated their parents as strength-based, did it mean that they were more likely to use their strengths? And if it did, did it reduce their levels of stress? Um, in this case, the, the use of strength-based, I, I applied that in a really kind of specific domain, and that is the domain of coping. So I wanted to know if younger children have strength-based parents, when they're confronted with stress, do they cope in a more strength-based way? Do they draw on their strengths to cope with a situation. And so what we did in the study was put forward two scenarios to these fifth and sixth graders. The first scenario was to do with uh, relationship stress and the second scenario to, was to do with task-related stress. So the young children read a little story and the, the relationship stress was, it went like this. It said, you and your best friend have made up a really fun game in the playground at school on the monkey bars. And you've been playing it all week, and it's Thursday, and your best friend gets really mad with you and says, it's not fair, you've had more turns than me. If you don't let me have more turns tomorrow at lunchtime, I'm not gonna be your friend anymore. Tell me how you would cope with that. How would you handle this situation? So these fifth and sixth graders wrote paragraphs about how they would handle that situation. And that was hilarious to read what they were, you know, ranging from like, well, I would punch them to, well, I would just find a new best friend to more strength-based coping approaches. You know, I would talk to them about fairness um, or I would say, it's okay, you can have more turns because in the long run it all works out. Or I would talk to my teacher, or I would talk to my parent. Um, and then we also gave them a second scenario, which was task-related stress. And this is how the story went. 
your teacher has given you a big assignment and you've had three weeks to do this project. Um, it's Monday and the project's due on Friday. And the teacher asks at the end of the day, please put up your hand if you have already started working on the project. And you are the only student in the class who does not put up their hand. What do you do? And again, they wrote what they would do. And again, there were some very humorous responses. All of those responses were coded for the degree to which the students were engaging in coping mechanisms that used their strengths. And what I found in the analysis was that those children who rated their parents as being more strength-based were more likely to engage in strength-based coping mechanisms. And as a result of that, reported lower levels of stress in the survey. So it's not just relevant for teenagers, it's also relevant for children. The final study I wanna share with you is whether it's relevant for us as parents, because for the first few years of my research, I was very much focused on what are the benefits of strength-based parenting to children and teenagers in terms of their well-being. And as you've seen, getting very consistent results that strength-based parenting enhances the well-being of teenagers and children. But I started thinking, well, what about us? Like, does it make a difference to, maybe it's enhancing the well-being of our kids, but it's really draining us. So this was a, a study that I've recently submitted and I invited 137 parents to be part of a um, four-week intervention that I designed. It, it, it involved two workshops with me and then two weeks of sort of home exercises to help parents become strength-based. Half of those parents went through the intervention and half of those parents were put on a wait list. So I said, look, I can't, I can't fit you into the workshops now, but I can fit you into the workshops in two months' time. And I pre-tested both of those groups on levels of positive emotion and a construct called parenting self-efficacy, which is basically looking at how confident do you feel in your role as a parent? So half of the group went through this four-week strength-based intervention and the other half just parenting as usual. And what I found at the end of that study was that those parents who had gone through the two workshops and the two weeks of strength-based exercises that they were doing at home, at the end of the study had significantly higher levels of positive emotion. And the question was specifically, when you think of your children, to what degree do you feel, and I had a list of positive emotions, to what degree do you feel love, joy, awe, wonder, happiness, calmness? So when the parents who'd done the strength-based parenting program answered at the end, they answered much higher. When I think of my child, I feel much more positive emotion. I feel much more joy. I feel much more gratitude. I feel much more serenity. I feel much more pride. I feel much more love. I feel much more awe and wonder. They also said they had higher levels of self-efficacy. So as a result of going through this program, they said, I feel more confident in my parenting now that I'm taking a strength-based approach. And I think actually the same mechanism is happening for the parents as it is for the children, in that once you start to take a strength-based approach and on a daily basis, you're looking at the bits of the clay that are already formed and you're looking at how to expand those, it's just a naturally more enjoyable way to parent. And because you're intentionally focusing on the strengths of your children, what they're doing well, what's going well for them, it creates more positive emotion in you. Parenting is hard, let's face it. It's just hard and it's long and you're doing it in amongst everything else. And it can be very easy to feel like I'm not doing a good job um, and I'm not making any progress because if you're always focusing on that hole in the clay, all you're seeing is the parts of the parenting that you're not working so well in. But once you start to shift your focus on a daily basis, you see the parts of your parenting that are working well. You see your children blossom before you. And so it, it, ha it allows you to have more positive emotions and it allows you to feel more confident because you're like, okay, I'm, I'm doing all right. I'm tracking okay. I'm doing a good job in creating this this young adult into, uh, into the world. So I just wanna finish on some action steps that you might consider taking, uh, leaving today. 
The first one is this technique of strength spotting. So what I invite you to do is to very consciously for the next week become a positive detective, but specifically for your children. So go home and challenge yourself to find two or three strengths in your children and to spot those strengths and as often as you can over the next week. Anytime you get a chance to engage with your son or daughter, spot their strengths and tell them about the strengths, tell them about what you see. Um, another thing that you can do, there are a number of strength surveys that are available. The free one is the Values in Action um, Institute survey, it's the Character Strength Survey. It's, in, it's translated into Spanish, so you can take it for yourself and you can find out what your top character strengths are. And you, if you have children above the age of 11, they can take it for free as well. So do the survey and have a discussion with your son and your daughter about well, what were your strengths, what are my strengths, what's similar, what's different. Connecting your son or daughter with strengths role models is always a really important thing to do. So maybe you are their role model, but maybe they have a, a strength in them that you don't have. In which case, find someone in your circle, find someone in your community, a relation, a teacher, a sports coach, someone that they know who has that strength so that that person can act as a mentor to bring forward that strength. When you have engaged in the survey and, and uh, most especially the strength spotting, sit down one day and write a letter to your children. Write a strength-based letter to them. Write a letter to say, these are the positive qualities that I see in you. These are the strengths. And give concrete examples. These are the ways that I see you use your strengths. And this is how I know that no matter what, you're gonna, things are gonna be okay. You're gonna end up okay because you have these strengths that are gonna be with you wherever you go. Wherever you go in the world, whatever you do, these strengths go with you. So this is, this is what I see in you and this is how I know you'll be okay. Um, my son Nicholas started at a new school this year and I wrote a strength letter for him and I gave it to him the day before he started at the new school to say to him, I know this is a change and it may be stressful, but these are the strengths that you have that are gonna help you to adjust. They're gonna help you to find new friends, that are gonna help you to do well and find your place in this new school. Um, finally, I invite you to look at the Strengths Exchange website. It's a website that myself and one of my Masters of Applied Positive Psychology students have put together. It's got a whole lot of free resources on how to be a strength-based parent. It's got videos of parents talking about being strength-based. It's got videos of children and teenagers. It's got games and it's got links to surveys and all sorts of things that you can do that um, can support you in taking a strength-based journey. A lot of what I've talked about today, in fact, a lot more than what I've talked about today is um, a culmination of a book that I've written called The Strength Switch. It's being published by Penguin Press in summer of next year. So um, July, August of next year, it will be available. It pulls together all of my science. It pulls together all of the, the relevant science in the field of positive psychology that's relevant for parenting um, with hundreds of different exercises and tips and stories and um, ways that will encourage you to become a strength-based parent. I'm really proud of the book and I'm really, um, I'm excited because I told you a part of my story earlier and reading that one book, The Optimistic Child, completely changed my trajectory. It changed the way I parented. And so I, I just hope that my book does the same for someone in the world and it, and it changes their trajectory. And just finally, um, if you want to stay in touch with me, please go to my website. If you click on the subscriber button, I'll send you lots of tips about strength-based parenting, um, the three most important questions that you should be asking yourself to become a strength-based parent, and um, you'll go on to my regular newsletter, which sends out lots of tips and those kinds of things. So that's it from me. Thank you so much again for um, your time and your attention. And